The 2014 legislative session is underway and lawmakers fast track emergency energy funds. Details in Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The gavel dropped at noon on Tuesday, February 25th, signaling the 88th legislature has reconvened. The House suspended its rules on the first day and took up a bill that would take $20 million in general fund money to help low-income Minnesotans pay for their energy bills. Senator Tom Saxock is carrying the bill in the Senate. He's here to talk a little bit about it. Senator, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Julie. How does your proposal for energy heat assistance, how does that vary from the House bill? The only real difference is the the Senate bills that came out of the Finance Committee added 5% for administration. Uh, the current uh, bill that came out of the House, I think, had 1.7 million. And just about everybody seems to be on board with this legislation. However, there tend to be some discussions, both in the House and in that Senate committee, on some of the bigger problems. For instance, how to maybe move people away from propane as a dependable source of heat and how to maybe have a more stable source of propane available. Do you think that this piece of legislation should address those bigger concerns? Well, I'm not sure uh, that it uh, it can, but what it can do is bring uh, to mind and bring to the forefront what some of our basic problems are. Because uh, if we have any kind of a severe winter uh, next year, we're going to end up with exactly the same problems. I think it'd be it'd be worthwhile for us to for for me to just go over maybe the three or four or five different reasons why uh, we got in this position that we did. The first one was the fact that we had this um, late harvest and so a lot of the propane uh, that would have been used earlier on the farms uh, got used a little bit later and, uh, and uh, that, was, that was important. Um, the, another thing is that um, the, the uh, propane companies have uh, decided that it's, uh, there's more opportunity in exporting their product than in leaving it on a domestic basis. So whereas 5% of the propane uh, last year was exported, we were up to 20% this year. So that, that lowered the supply. Then what happened, of course, is we had this, uh, are, and are continuing to have this horrendous winter with cold temperatures. And, uh, and so uh, people were, became more and more dependent on this. And, uh, and, and the rest is kind of history. We we'll continue to have that, and, and the price of propane, then with all of the things that I mentioned, went from just under $2 to over $6. So we can see how we put a strain on the system. And this went fast, you know, the fast track route with the House suspending its rules to take this up on the very first day of session. Right. So do you intend to carry this through to the end of session, not this part of it, but maybe looking into the bigger problems, you know, the issues that you just brought up and trying well, to resolve some of those. Yeah, the reason that I'm the chief author on the bill is because I, I have a particular problem in north central Minnesota and that there's no natural gas. So there's more, more of a percentage, of particularly of our lower income people, are on propane. And, and so it would be helpful and I think more stabilizing um, if, well, for instance, uh, well, one of the really good natural gas lines comes up to Pine River, which is right in the middle of Cass County. If we could, if we could get that to Cass Lake, it would make a huge difference in, in, uh, in some of the things we could do. So I think that's, those are things that, um, that we're going to work on. I was frank, uh, frankly uh, surprised on all the interest that we had in terms of problem solving in the Finance Committee this morning. Of course, we'll cover it as this bill makes it onto the Senate floor. And it will, right. It'll be on Monday, and, and my guess is that the, uh, the next story, day or even later in the day, it'll, uh, it'll probably be accepted by the House, and I, the governor, I've, I'm told, awaits it anxiously. Okay. Senator Saxhog, thanks for your time. Thank you. The health insurance exchange, known as MinSure, continues to draw some praise and some criticism. 
We sat down with Minshore's interim CEO, Scott Lights, to discuss those concerns. But before we air that segment, John Bruin recaps exactly how Minshore moved through the legislative process in 2013. Major health care legislation passed by the federal government in 2010, referred to as the Affordable Care Act, had a significant impact on how Minnesota moved forward with its health care policy. One aspect of the Affordable Care Act gave states the option to either create their own health insurance exchanges or accept a federal health care plan, a topic widely debated by lawmakers during the 2013 session. There are concerns about this bill and I am trying to take them um, very seriously, meeting with everybody that I possibly can to understand their concerns fully and uh, get the right bill at the end of the day to really protect Minnesota consumers, individuals and small businesses and Minnesota's health insurance and health care industry in the very best way possible. And I think that a Minnesota approach is far preferable to the alternative, which is a federal one-size-fits-all approach. I think that it is better to try to create a system that allows people to make decisions for themselves. Let's put in place processes and, and, and procedures and plans or programs. Let's put in place things that give people choices, give people opportunities to make choices for themselves, choose their doctors, choose their insurers, choose their plans. We may not agree with them. We might not think they're right, but let's let them do that. And I think you folks on the other side, I think what, what you say is, well, we just can't allow that. We can't allow somebody to make a bad decision. We can't allow somebody to choose a health insurance plan that we know isn't right for them. We can't allow that. We have to make sure they only have these two or three to choose from. And even though they're astronomically costly, that's all right. We'll get the federal government to come in and pay for the cost and everything will be great. We're going to have a tool for Minnesota consumers, families, individuals, businesses uh, to, for the first time, be able to shop on an apples to apples comparison for insurance products. After considerable committee discussion and floor debate, Minnesota legislators opted to develop a state health insurance exchange and created what is now called Minsure. Online they can compare uh, health plans, qualified health plans that are um, available through the exchange, through Minsure, in terms of a number of factors, some of them being premiums, um, cost-sharing requirements, uh, provider network, uh, what the provider networks are going to look like for the health plans. They also can determine whether they're eligible for medical assistance or el eligible for the Minnesota Care Program or whether they're eligible for um, the federal premium tax credits that are available through the Affordable Care Act. And to be eligible your income has to be up to 400 percent of um, the federal poverty guidelines. The legislature made changes to other government health care programs in 2013. The Affordable Care Act included the option for states to expand Medicare programs, or what Minnesota refers to as medical assistance. The state again uh, decided to um, take advantage of that option in last session, pass legislation that expanded the income eligibility for the medical assistance program for uh, uh, parents and adults without dependent children so um, and for children but so the medical assistance program now for the income eligibility for parents and adults without dependent children goes up to 133 percent and for children it's 275 or it's 275 percent of federal poverty guidelines. The Affordable Care Act also made available to states the option to create a basic health plan intended to produce more options for lower income individuals. Minnesota um, again uh, decided to um, take advantage of that option and um, again last session passed legislation that essentially amended our Minnesota care program uh, to become the basic health plan um, beginning January 1st 2015. It's basically our Minnesota care program that's going to be eligible for individuals and families between 133% and 200% who would otherwise go in through Minsure and buy through the private market. But because they're a lower income 
families and individuals, um, the basic health plan will provide a, a, a better benefit set, um, more benefits that maybe this population um, would need. Um, plus, the premiums and the cost sharing requirements uh, will be a lot less than what they would have to have paid on the private market. Here to provide an update on Minnesota's health insurance exchange, we have the interim CEO of Minsure, Scott Lights. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. First, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Lights, more than 100,000 people have now enrolled in Minsure as of last week's numbers. What does that mean? Well, it means that um, we have really succeeded over, over a milestone now. We have over 100,000 people enrolled. Um, about two-thirds of those are on uh, public programs, so we're getting those folks into uh, insurance coverage, which is very important. Those are new enrollees who are coming in uh, covered, and about uh, over 30,000 people in private coverage. So we are um, continuing to grow, grow our enrollment. It continues to go up, um, which is a really, really great thing. You brought up the, the private versus public, so let's get into that a little bit. There has been some concern from the GOP that a lot of young, healthy individuals have not been signing up, and that's a big key component of Minsure. So where are we going in that direction of the private coverage versus public? Well, what we knew was going to happen initially was that we were likely going to skew a little bit more heavily towards the public side, and that's because I think there's um, continuing enrollment as people meet uh, income eligibility criteria, they're able to enroll in Medicaid or in Minnesota Care. What we anticipated and what we're likely to see, or what we're starting to see, is that um, as we near the March 31st deadline for people to have health insurance coverage, people are likely to put off going into coverage until they really need to. And especially that's gonna be true among uh, a younger, healthier population. And so what we're anticipating seeing is a higher uptick in the month of March among that population. Um, so while things have skewed a little bit more public, we do anticipate that that will shift a little bit as we move into March. What if those expectations don't come to fruition? Do you have a plan to try to pull in that demographic? Yeah, we're working hard. Um, we uh, launched a series of ads last week uh, talking about the importance of, of health insurance coverage to real Minnesotans. We have testimonials that are airing. But then we're also doing um, 30 cities in 30 days, which means we're going to be hitting, um, doing outreach in all in 30 cities over the course of the next month to really try to outreach to that group. I think Minnesotans really want to know why is it so important for that demographic to be a part of this program? Well, the importance of that demographic really is the following. Um, what, insurance operates on what are called risk pools, meaning that um, you need healthy people to cover the costs of sick people when they're, when they're uh, needing care. So the, um, when you have a stable risk pool, you have a good mix of young people and older people so that as older people or sicker people need, need coverage and care, uh, the younger people are there uh, providing um, insurance and providing money to the pool uh, but not needing care so that when they're sick down the road, they'll also be a stable pool. So having a good mix of people is very, very important. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the other GOP concerns right now from IT issues to apparent lack of oversight management wise. From your viewpoint, what are the key concerns at this point? So we've made a lot of progress on, on things over the course of the past two months. Um, I'll tick through a few of them. Uh, the first is our call center. Um, that was an area of concern. Um, I joined the organization in mid-December. Um, call center t wait times around that time were, were 60 minutes or more for, for people calling in. We now have that down to one to three minutes and uh, anticipate that staying at that level. So we've made a lot of progress there. Uh, on the website itself, um, in uh, November and December, about uh, one in every five clicks resulted in some sort of an error. There was a lot of problems with the website initially. Now that's down to less than 5%. And so we've made a ton of progress there. We still have to make more progress on the website. Not everybody has a really clean experience, but the fact is that um, the experience of individuals and consumers is much better than it was previously. How financially solvent is Minsure at this point? Do you anticipate going back to the legislature for money? Well, for 2014, we are fully funded with federal funding, so that isn't an issue for us to deal with. We don't anticipate going to the legislature this year. What we'll be um, required to do is in March submitting a budget, a detailed budget to the legislature for what our 2015 and beyond operating expenses and our likely revenues will be. And in fact, uh, at the next board meeting we'll have, we'll, we'll start to be really digging into that issue. The GOP, are, it, uh, many members are already anticipating coming to the legislature for more money and are already coming up with ideas for proposals to, to not necessarily to fund Minsure in the future. So how are you trying to navigate through all of this uh, 
this indecision and, and not really sure where you stand with the legislature? Well, the, the interesting part about Minister's budget, of course, is that we have to project out for 2015 based on enrollment that we see for 2014. And so we'll know a lot more once the March enrollment figures come in, and then we'll have a lot more information to be able to base our budget on. Right now, we'll probably take a conservative approach in looking at what our future budget needs are going to be. Um, and then based on what we know in terms of enrollment starting in at the end of March, we'll be able to project forward a little bit better for open enrollment uh, moving into October. That will help us have a much better feel to it. Let's talk a little bit about that March 31st deadline. It's the deadline to have health insurance or face a financial penalty. Is the website, in your opinion, ready to handle another surge? We believe it is, yes. We've made a lot of improvements to the website. Um, people are able to get through much cleaner than they were previously. Doesn't mean that every single individual gets through perfectly without a problem. We still do know that there are some individuals who have challenges, particularly if they have complicated family situations where they might have a child on Medicaid, but, that, but they themselves might be eligible for tax credits. We have put in place backup processes um, if for, for, Mar for the March enrollment period to ensure that if people aren't able to get in coverage through the website, which is where we do encourage that they do go because that is the best and easiest place for them to get coverage. But if they can't get through and aren't able to uh, complete the enrollment process, we will have backups in paper and other pop possible ways of doing that. So Mr. Lights, you've basically stepped into a role amid a lot of controversy. So kind of give me your impression of how Minsure is operating and what you kind of see, for lack of a better word, what do you think the legacy, how do you think the public will remember Minsure two or three years down the road if indeed it remains intact and so does the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think it's important to remember that um, while it had, had its challenges in the fall, uh, the, the site did go live October 1st and the, and the, and the lift to get that done over um, what, what our chief uh, IT officer has called a three-year project in about 10 months. Um, was pretty amazing and staff um, on, at Minsure are really, really remarkable and they've done an amazing job. Um, I think we've continued to make improvements to the site. It's a much more functional site now than it was um, back uh, two months ago. We were able to get people through much cleaner now. Um, we hear a lot of very good reports from navigators and others in the, in the community that it's doing much better and we hear that from the public as well. I think the legacy two to three years from now is going to be that Minsure is going to be a very valued and important uh, tool in the lives of Minnesotans. Uh, it's a place where they now can go and compare health insurance coverage options, see what's available to them. It's created competition uh, and transparency in the marketplace, which wasn't previously as strong as it could have been. And I think Minnesotans are going to really come to value that and also the, the options that they have, plus the other things about the Affordable Care Act with guaranteed issue and uh, not uh, the, the inability to cancel policies and other things. Okay, Scott Lights, we are out of time. Thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report set. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. This group of House and Senate Republicans is calling for President Obama to exempt Minnesota from the health insurance exchange. Senator Michelle Benson has been a staunch opponent of Minsure. She's here to talk a little bit more about this health insurance exchange and where she'd like to see health insurance go in the future. Thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Senator, let's begin with a, the news conference that you just recently hosted. You, you essentially asked President Obama to allow Minnesota to opt out of the exchange. What would it take, do you think, for your request to even be considered? Well, and it's not just the exchange. It's the assertion that Minnesota already had world-class health care, and we had low uninsured rates, and we had provisions for people who were difficult to insure. And so instead of just turning everything over to federal rulemakers, we think Minnesotans here in our legislature, Minnesotans in their community, are going to make the best decisions for health care. And after we've seen some of the damage that's been done by the federal law, I think a lot of us would like to have Minnesota back in control of our health care. During this news conference, you, uh, you discussed real broadly five amendments that were offered last year during the legislative session that you believe would have helped ensure be the whole process be more efficient. What were those five? What were the key changes? that you think should have been made, and do you think they could be brought up this session? Um, I don't think any minsure based legislation is going to be brought up this session. It's just politically too difficult uh, for the authors of the original bill to, to shepherd through some changes. We are in election year, the governor's up for election, and so I don't think Governor Dayton would be very open to making changes in something he's considered a signature piece of his administration policy. Um, some of the things that would have most decidedly helped, uh, giving the legislature more say, uh, giving the legislative oversight committee more say over the operations of Minsher, just the ability to go in and say, we see a problem, let's take a deeper look. Uh, the board structure, 
very critical uh, missed opportunity. For example, if there had been insurance professionals and brokers that were allowed to sit on that board in July when the interlinks between the insurance companies and Minsure were not on a path for October 1st, somebody could have said, you know what, this isn't ready, we need to start making a plan. Instead, we had to wait until the middle and end of November to find out that that was failing. Even though the insurance companies knew it wasn't working, the 820 files and the 834 files and all these levels of detail and expertise would have been there at the table. And, and the board kind of stepped back from that responsibility because there was such a steep learning curve. But if you had industry experts, they would have helped mitigate some of these problems early on. Um, better spending controls at the legislature, the active purchaser provision, the executive team under previous management spent a lot of time managing the executive purchaser process, I'm sorry, the active purchaser process. And if they had stayed focused on getting the exchange rolled out, I think we would have had better turnout. The Legislative Oversight Committee has held a lot of hearings on this issue up until even last week. And we've heard Scott Lights, the interim CEO of Minshore, discuss how he thinks it's moving forward. Are you, are you content? Not, content's not the right word. How do you feel about the steps that they have been making to try to reduce call, time, call center time and, and the issues with the IT? Is it enough? Um, well, in the Legislative Oversight Committee, I think we have had six meetings. Maybe it's only been five, but we really didn't start getting engaged until, uh, much as I might have wanted to, we didn't start getting engaged until the problems became readily apparent to even the most casual observer. Um, I am pleased that Assistant Commissioner Lights is at the helm. He is a very thoughtful and pragmatic person. I think he is earnestly trying to do the best job that he can. Um, but the IT problems that we have are structurally built in and we might have to make some massive foundational changes into the way uh, customer information is handed off from one vendor to another and that's why there is a new vendor coming in. I haven't heard who's been selected but it was either the 25th or the 26th that the final RFPs were due and would be vetted. So by the end of this week we believe we'll know who that new vendor is. Yes, it's more money but uh, we need somebody there who really knows how to run IT, who knows project management from beginning to end. Uh, the Dayton administration took Maximus out of that role uh, very early in the process. Instead of leaving project management experts in, in place, we had public policy experts. And really, this was a massive IT project, and the experts weren't there. So I applaud the commissioner for recognizing the problem and seeking a solution. You can't move any faster than the IT problems can be solved. Uh, the call center time is declining because fewer calls are being made. And so uh, while they're getting some technical things fixed, I think there's also some fatigue that we're seeing in the customer base. Senator, we're just about out of time, but I do want to ask you, if Minshore continues into perpetuity, where do you see your role? Is there anything that, that could change that would get, gain your support? Um, my biggest concern with Minsure is the amount of authority we've turned over to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in Washington, D.C. Um, because we have adopted so many provisions, well, actually all of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, uh, CMS can now tell us how to run Minnesota Care, and we're looking at a huge deficit in Minnesota Care. And so until that foundational piece is moved out of our way. It's very hard for us as legislators to have reasonable conversations about where Minnesota's health care system should go. Okay, Senator Michelle Benson, we're out of time, but we appreciate your time as always. Thank you. I'm so glad to have been invited back. Thank you, Julie. Sunday liquor sales is an issue that comes up virtually every year and could again in 2014. We sat down with the author of the House bill, Representative Jennifer Loon, to discuss her proposal and its chances for passage. Well, basically it removes the prohibition uh, that is in the state bill that you know applies to the entire state of Minnesota, no off-sale liquor on Sundays. And you know, whenever the state sets a statute in place with regards to liquor, uh, the municipalities, city governments, have the ability to narrow the focus from where the state sets basically the floor. And so, and that would be the case with my proposal. Um, while the state would not uh, put that policy in place, certainly local governments will be able to say, 
we know our community and you know we don't think we want or need our liquor stores open on Sunday and they would have the ability to pass that that ordinance or that that law. The tap rooms are pushing for this and so how does that kind of change the game? Do you think it's pushing momentum in favor of passing this legislation? I think what you're seeing is a an interesting coalition of people starting to to push for a change in this area. Um, you know, the Sunday liquor sale ban has been in place since Prohibition ended in the early 30s. And um, people are recognizing that consumers shop differently than they did back in the 30s or 40s or even 10 years ago. Um, Sunday is a very active retail sales day for people to go out and do their shopping. Plus, with the boom in uh, the startup of craft brewers and breweries and tap rooms uh, that are open, uh, you cannot go in and get your growler filled on Sundays um, in, in those tap rooms. And so that's another uh, interest area that, is, that has been drawn into this debate. Let's talk about last session. The House rejected a Sunday sales bill by a vote of 106 to 21. The Senate version didn't even make it off the floor. So, or didn't even make it to the floor, excuse me. So, what kind of reception are you getting? Do you think you're going to be able to get some support for this? Well, with every proposal, and anything to do with liquor tends to be a little bit controversial, um, but the process that's used is very important. And I think, you know, trying to add an amendment to a bill that's on the floor um, you know, is not necessarily the best way to go about this. Um, the liquor bills that pass through the House and the Senate uh, tend to be very carefully worked out. Uh, the proposals that, that are in them that move uh, generally have a bipartisan and strong agreement, or if they're too controversial, they're, they're left out of the bill. And I think we've got to run through that process with this initiative as well. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have hearings in the Commerce Committee where those for and opposed to the idea can you know, air that in a full uh, public hearing and that perhaps then uh, we can actually uh, see some progress on this issue. Now we spoke with Senator Roger Reinhardt a few weeks ago on this program about his Sunday liquor sales bill and his is it's different and quite different than your version. However, he said he would support yours if it came to the Senate. Would you support his if his version came to the House? Uh, yes, yes, actually we, we've talked about that and um, you know I think are, are pretty well allied in trying to see if we can um, again, make some progress on this issue that I think uh, the statewide ban does not necessarily serve all of our communities well, and we owe it to them, in my opinion, to let them have the, the decision on this. My last question for you, Representative Loon, is you talked a little bit about process. So what do you need to do to try to get this to the point where it can gain enough support to pass? Well, I think uh, getting a hearing or two out of the House Commerce Committee is on which I serve, and I'm hoping Chairman Atkins will We'll find some time in a very short, compressed session uh, to hold some hearings. I think some of the uh, information that's been put out, we need to have a full um, hearing on. I know some of the uh, stores or, or others are saying that there wouldn't be increased sales if it's op open on Sundays, but um, we've had 16 states that have changed their laws uh, in the past 10 or 12 years, and the data from those states indicates there are indeed increased sales, anywhere from three to six percent. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.